What a week it has been. Uh, last weekend, my wife Becky and I, um, we uh, had the chance to get away. We, we celebrated last year's anniversary because we couldn't do anything last year, right? And so we celebrated our 15th year anniversary um, this past weekend, which means I don't have a big turnaround time for the 16th because that's, sheesh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and so then we got back, and um, man, it's been a powerful week. I, um, I got to be with... My brother and my friend, Ken Brown, and as he took his last breath on Wednesday night, he, his spirit stepped through the door, and he was home with Jesus. And then yesterday, I had the chance to, to be with, uh, with the family of, of Bill Parker and with Lila, and, and what a celebration of a man who, who's, who's, who gave his life to Jesus, and his whole testimony was centered around that, that God made something beautiful out of his life. And then this, this today, to celebrate with Heather and how God, how God, did you see that? Like, like God has been working at her life all along the way. And, and I know a little bit about her story too, that, that, that her mom wanted her to know Jesus like this. And for it to come full circle. God is at work. And it's quite a way to, to wrap up this series on the hope of holiness where we have, we have really focused in on this concept and what we're seeing here is that, that the hope of holiness is that God wants to do more. God wants to do more in our lives. That God loves us way too much to settle for a half-hearted relationship with us. You ever been in a half-hearted relationship? <laughs> it's not a very good one, right? When, when you feel like you're giving your all and, and you're pouring your energy and everything into it and the other person's like, eh, <laughs> maybe, sometimes, I don't know if I feel like it. That's not much of a friendship. That's not much of a relationship. And God does not want to settle for that kind of relationship with us. But for so many people... They have settled for a half-hearted relationship with God. And what happens when we settle for a half-hearted relationship with God is that the world around us sees a half-hearted view of God. Half-hearted. That's why so many people are confused. When they see Christians who act and talk and live nothing like Jesus. Well, I'll tell you something. I know for us as a church, we want to do better. We want to do better at this concept of discipleship. And, and discipleship goes back to the, the last part of, of the book of Matthew when Jesus gives this command to his followers to go and make disciples. And that's why, as Dusty said earlier, Pastor Connie Borth, who's going to be our executive pastor of discipleship, she's coming. And we are going to refocus. We are going to double down and zero in on our efforts to helping people become disciples of Jesus. We want every single person from infant to the end of life to know where they are in their process, to know where they are in their faith journey of becoming more like Jesus. And so we are going to double our efforts. We're going to triple our efforts. We're going to pour everything we can into that. Because I believe there are more Heathers in this world that God wants to bring home more prodigal sons and sons and daughters. And so, we want people to come to realize that God wants to do more in their lives. That they can be filled and helped and guided by God's Holy Spirit. And here's the clincher of, of this last message in this series of the hope of holiness. The, the heart, the, the, the main focus, the thrust of today. Here it is. The more 
that God wants to do in all of our lives is to make us, what's it say? More like Jesus. That is the more that God wants to do in all of our lives. That is the very heart of it all. The goal of the Holy Spirit is to help us become more like Jesus in thought, in word, and in deed, in the way we live. That is why we do everything that we do. It is out of the Spirit-filled life that the more that God wants to do flows out of. This is why we have Sunday classes. This is why we gather every single Sunday just like this. This is why we want to grow our faith. This is why we serve our community. This is why we believe that God has called us to care about the world. Because our goal, our purpose is to have every area of our lives transformed, conformed, and formed into a reflection of Jesus. This is the why. This is the hope of holiness. By the help of God's Holy Spirit, listen, our lives can become more like Jesus. And yes, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, we can love like Jesus. Like Dr. Mason said a few weeks ago, the district superintendent for the the North Carolina Church of the Nazarene, he talked about the fruits of the Spirit. We can have love. It begins with love. I, I don't know how else to tell you. It begins with love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. It can happen. I know. It sounds really good. And we come in here and we have this really incredible experience and, and we sing and we shout and we do whatever that thing was that Dusty was talking about moving around. But you say, Aaron, when I walk out the door, I don't know if you really know, there's a real world out there, and there's real life. Have you seen all the racism? Have you seen the amount of sexual exploitation and immorality? Have you seen how people in the margins are taken advantage of? Have you seen how bad it is, Aaron? Have you seen the abuse in churches? Have you seen how victims have been silenced? Have you seen how the actions of some in the church kind of looks like more like rotten fruit than fruit of the Spirit? Yes, I know. I have seen it. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, it gets incredibly discouraging. There are a lot of different views in our world and culture. And there are behaviors and actions and mindsets that absolutely can lead us away from the purpose that God has for our lives. There are behaviors and actions and mindsets that can lead our lives in a completely opposite direction of Jesus' life. There are. And when we choose those ways over the ways of Jesus, when we stop listening and seeking the leading of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, listen, the fruit of the Spirit begins to disappear. I mean, why? Why would we produce fruit in our lives of a Spirit that we're not paying any attention to? Why? And we also begin to lose the hope of holiness that God has for our lives. So what are we supposed to do about it? I mean, how do we, we deal with this? How do we, how do we live beyond the walls, beyond the gatherings, beyond this moment? The, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a group in Ephesus. We're gonna be looking in... Um, 
Ephesians chapter four in the New Testament. If you wanna, if you wanna look that up, it'll also be on the screen. But this guy, Paul, you have to remember, he, he was a religious leader in the Jewish faith. He had, he had been a really high up religious leader in the Jewish faith. He knew his Jewish faith, his Jewish religion. And you got to understand a little bit of his background too, that those who were inside the Jewish religion believed and saw people who did not have a faith in their God, who did not believe like they did, who did not follow the, the, the faith that they had grown up with. Anyone who was outside of the faith, they referred to them as Gentiles. It's another word for non-believers. And so Paul writes this letter to try to to help this young church in Ephesus to remember who they are. Listen to what he says here in the book of Ephesians chapter four, starting in <coughs> verse 17. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, what's it say? Renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous, and say it with me, holy. Hmm. See, Paul is talking to a church, to a group, a people who are surrounded by a culture that is swept up in what's called idol worship. They had many gods that they worshiped, that they tried to please. They had a way of life that they, that they were so consumed by. And in fact, some of the gods that they tried to please, they, they had special worship services and, and special sexual, sexual type of acts that they believed connected them with these gods. There was all kinds of confusion about what to do and how to act and to appease this God and to appease that God. And so... Paul is trying to help the church remember. Because see, the church is made up of these people who used to live in that kind of world, who used to live in those kinds of mindsets and in those kinds of behaviors, right? They used to live in that, and so he knew they would remember what that was like. And so he was reminding them. He was telling them what it is like without God, without a relationship with God. He's saying that there are those who, whose minds are, are closed, who are full of darkness, who have closed their hearts and hardened their hearts. Now, I know, I think about like those who have, he's referring to saying that they've closed their minds off, really. I know there are a lot of people who, who don't think that faith in Jesus is... Well, they, they don't think you really have freedom of thought, that you're, that you're confined because of your faith in Jesus. But I want to tell you something. The fact is, faith in Jesus actually sets our minds free to discover the purpose God has for our lives. There is a freedom of the mind that God does through Jesus Christ. I mean, there is nothing like being, being free, set free to, to, to love to love people who don't love you back. That is freedom. Mm -hmm. That is freedom. When we come to a place in our lives where we are set free to explore 
and learn, I love this, all the ways that God is working in our world. I mean, there is something about being able to, to live your life with an awareness that God is at work, right? No matter how bad it might get, no matter what you're going through. I mean, even for you, Heather, in this story that you shared about your own life, right? You are aware of how God has been working. The other day, I was, I was in a situation where I, I was... I wasn't sure what I was going to do about it, and, and I was praying, and I was asking God to help me with it, and, and I didn't know what was going to take place, and I, and I remember praying this, this, you know, it's, God, part the Red Sea, because I can't see past it, and as soon as I said, amen, I got a phone call from somebody who showed me an, another route. <laughs> Talk about freedom. Freedom of the mind to see that. Free to see and tell people how much God loves them. It comes with some heaviness, too. I will tell you, free to see the injustices in our world and to care. Imagine this. To care about what the God of all the universe cares about. To care about those who are suffering you know, I, I know, I know some people would rather like, I'd rather not know all the things that are going bad. I'd rather just stick my head in the sand and forget it. I want to tell you something. It's a dangerous place to be when you don't feel what the world is going through. I think we lose touch with God when we don't pay attention. But I'll tell you something else. The opposite of freedom is captivity, isn't it? The opposite of sight is blindness. See, Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus that there are certain behaviors and actions and mindsets that will lead them away. Paul says there are those who blatantly refuse to trust God with their lives. And in their refusing, in their refusing, they have no sense of shame. And what Paul is getting to is that, that there is a danger when we get to a place where we don't know right from wrong, where everything goes. And the phrase in Greek here for, for this, this, this phrase of, of no sense and shame, it, it means to lose all sensitivity, to become calloused. It, it's to lose all sense of direction and to get lost further and further. And it's not just sexuality, all right? It's greed, it's anger, it's bitterness, it's exploitation. It's not a good place to be when you cannot tell right from wrong. But Paul says to them, to them, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. In other words, Paul is saying to those in the church, right? I love this because I'll tell you, he's writing a letter to the people who he assumes knows about Jesus, who he assumes have some kind of relationship with Jesus, with God, right? So they have some kind of a background to go off. He's writing it to them. I, I'm always amazed by how many people tell me that I need to preach more condemning sermons toward people outside the church when I read something like this. Paul is talking to the people on the inside, okay? And he's saying to them, you know better. You know that's not the way you should live. You know that's not how Jesus lived. You know that's not how Jesus acted. You know that's not the way Jesus treated people. You know better. I love this because this is where I believe Paul is telling them that God wants to do more, all right? That God wants to do more in their lives. That it's more than just the initial recognition of who Jesus is. 
That it's more than just going to Sunday school and hearing about Jesus. That it's more than just going to church. That it's more than just reading your Bible. That it's more than just tithing and giving. That it's more than just serving. That it's more than just simply saying, I'm a Christian. God wants to help us let go. God wants us to let go of the old way of living. <laughs> God wants us to step out of the old clothes and into something brand completely new. Becky and I last weekend, we, uh, we, we, we got to check off one of the things on our bucket list of where we traveled to. And we went to San Francisco, California. I'll tell you something about San Francisco that I didn't comprehend there are some big old hills in San Francisco. Did a lot of walking. Did a lot of sitting down and stopping, too. I'll tell you something else I didn't quite realize. Now, I know it's, it's a little bit different this week because they have this unusual heat wave over there in the Northwest, but there's some big-time wind out there that blows off the Pacific Ocean and through the bay and I, there were a few times I didn't think I was going to ever get warm because even in June the temperature I mean you know 60 degrees out there feels a lot different than 60 degrees here it was cold at times and I tell you you cannot go to San Francisco without seeing the, one of the main attractions right you know what that is the Golden Gate Bridge and if you're Aaron and Becky, you can't just go to San Francisco and see the Golden Gate Bridge. You have to walk all two miles of it. <laughs> you are all in. But remember, I told you, there's some heavy-duty wind. And I, I think it's extra heavy out there on that bridge. And so we knew that. And we knew that what we were wearing, the the little jackets we had weren't going to be enough. And so we found a store that had some jackets on sale that were just a little bit heavier. And we put them on. Oh, and it, it actually felt good out there. As I put that jacket on and I, I, I started out and, and the sun was, was shining down and so the dark material began to warm up and I, you know, I was just settling in for my long journey across the bridge. I, again, though, the, the original Greek here looking at, at that phrase of uh, put on the new nature. It's really talking about like when you, when you sink yourself into it. When you, when you really allow yourself to, to draw into it, right? Paul says, Throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And while, while the Holy Spirit does the work in our lives, yes, that is all about what the Holy Spirit does, but the initial step, step takes effort. It is a choice that we have to make to choose to run toward God, to choose to let go of that old former way of life, to choose to step into the water and be baptized, allowing the Holy Spirit to wash over us and wash us clean of that old former way of life. I love that. The Holy Spirit of God can renew your mind and attitude. God wants to do more with our minds, which impacts the way we live. This is how the Holy Spirit of God works in us, renewing our minds and our thoughts and our attitudes. It's, that's why we're, we're focusing on that discipleship. That's, that's what discipleship is. It is, is allowing and listening and following and, and, and just, and you know, it's like putting on that jacket and just 
being drawn into it. The new nature. The new nature. I said at the beginning of this series that what Jesus has brought to us and what, what God is doing through Jesus is creating a new humanity. God is bringing about. And Paul says here, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. What a phrase. I'll tell you something though, be careful with that phrase. Be careful with those words. Make sure you understand who the God is that Paul is talking about here, that we're created to be like. We were not created to be like a God who looks like us. We were created to look like Jesus, truly righteous and holy. We were created to be like Jesus. This is the hope of holiness. The hope of holiness is that the Holy Spirit of God can take our minds and, and you know what he does? He gives us the mind of Christ. That's what he does. Paul says in the book of Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter two, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He writes, he says, when we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. It makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. And he quotes the book of Isaiah when he says, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach them, to teach him? But we understand these things. For we have the, say it with me, mind of Christ. So it's possible. It is possible to have the mind of Jesus. It is possible to have a life that is filled with the hope of God's holiness in us. Christ is our holiness. And the more, listen, the more that God wants to do in all of our lives is to make us more like Jesus. This is the hope of holiness. Would you bow your heads right where you are while you're sitting there? I'm going to do something a little bit different today than I normally do. I'm going to ask you some questions, but I'm going to give you a chance to respond in a different way. First of all, I want to encourage you to receive the Holy Spirit in your life. But before you can get there, I want you to start with Jesus. And if you are in this room today and you have not started with Jesus, you have not started a relationship with Jesus, I want you to start today. I want you to ask Jesus to come into your life. I want you to let him see everything. I want you to pull it all out and say, here it is, Jesus. I want you to ask him to forgive you. Forgive you for trying to do it on your own. Forgive you for, for allowing all the other stuff to cloud your mind to forgive you for refusing him. Today, listen to the voice of Jesus calling you and say yes to Jesus. And then maybe some of us today, 
maybe we haven't taken that next step and embraced the work of the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about this this week. For three years, the disciples followed Jesus, walked with Jesus, went everywhere Jesus went. They even practiced and did a little of the things that Jesus did. And yet even at the end of those three years, it wasn't until Jesus came back to life and met them in a room that he breathed his spirit upon them that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So today, let this be the day that you receive the Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe you need to recommit, renew. Maybe, maybe you need to be revived by the power of God's Holy Spirit. So here's what we're going to do. The team is going to sing this song called More Like Jesus. And I'm going to stand right here, right down here, right front and center. And today, if you would like me to pray with you, and you know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, if you wanna be baptized today after hearing this, we'll do that. We got the water, it's still pretty warm. <laughs> but I'm gonna stand right here. And if you wanna receive Jesus into your life, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit into your life, if there's anything that I can pray about for you, I'm gonna stand right here. We'll take as long as we need to, and I will pray with you. I'll turn the microphone off. It'll just be me and you. But you'll have to get up. You'll have to make a move. You'll have to step out. In fact, I'll make it a little easier. I'm going to have all of us stand right now. As the team sings, if you want to move forward, come, and I will pray with you right here, right now.